Hello and welcome to the National Michael Chekhov Association's talk on technology, techies, and why technicians can benefit from learning Michael Chekhov's technique. And today I have, we have four of us here, myself, I am Lisa Dalton, the president and one of the master teachers of the National Michael Chekhov Association. We have our colleague, Charlie Bowles, who is our executive producer. Charlie, please say hello. Hello. <laughs> and uh, Charlie does quite a bit of technology himself, uh, especially in the audiovisual realm. And we have uh, what, uh, one of our um, NCA certified um, design candidates, Pablo Guero Monge. Pablo, will you mm -hmm. introduce yourself? Well, I'm a I'm a beginner student a student of Michael Chekhov, but I've been uh, working on, on design and teaching here in in Arkansas. And um, yeah, this is um, I'm I'm a really fan of Michael Chekhov and design. I can see a lot of ways in which um, the designs aspect can be uh, lead by the, the, the Michael Chekhov process. Beautiful. And with us, we have Mavis Jennings. And Mavis is one of our newest candidates, teacher and directing candidate. And Mavis is responsible for creating this event because it is his interest and inquiry into furthering this question of how or why, really, why might uh, technicians want to know about Michael Chekhov's work. So Mavis, will you share us please a little bit um, in detail about your performance and music and, um, and, and directing background that brings this context forward? Sure. Um background on, on myself is just that I, I grew up in a rural area well outside of show business or any kind of theater or any kind of arts. And so I, I was always concocting or say devising what art was for me from a very pure, natural, instinctive place. And it was very long, it was a very long time until, a, you know, college days where I was first introduced to it, the contextual idea of organized art training. Um, and uh, after moving to New York City, I, I obtained a, a job as a singer and an artist with Cirque du Soleil. Um, and I, I received a lot of training from Cirque du Soleil uh, in a context that was very similar to Michael Chekhov technique, but it was um, it was under the uh, Jacques Lecoq school of, of training. Yes. Um, I uh, found after I left Cirque du Soleil and I came for an M M MFA at Kent State University, I found that Michael Chekhov technique very much so communicated to my instinctive way of thinking about art and thinking about the world and what it was I wanted to say. Um, I then took the, you know, in the training that we did this past summer, I was able to sort of take the ball and run with it in, in some ways because I, I was, I had sort of became a bit, un, I'd say a bit unhealthy in, in my my feelings about my future and my art. And it seemed like everything was in the past and somehow um, some of these simple exercises unlocked a certain path forward for me artistically. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say enough about what the art, do, what this technique does, not only for it say to enable an actor to be more inside themselves and to be more authentic in a role, to be more inspired, but also um, what it does <laughs> for actors health and, and for an artist's health and for an artist's um, uh, ability to gain trust in their inspiration. Those three eyes were very important to me, the inspiration, the imagination, and the intellect. Very important for me to get back on my feet and get going again. Um, I was approached by an old friend who was very much so enamored by the Cirque du Soleil technique of creating a fusion between technical theater and artistic, um, the artistic movement and gymnastics, acrobatics on the stage. And he was a professor at Berkeley School of Music and moved up and was just recently granted the ability to create this new school in New York City that uh, has the mandate or the aim to raise the level of technical theater um, or, to, or to innovate technical theater. And he asked me 
I was just out of the blue. I was in my studio, my COVID studio, writing a new screenplay. And um, he asked me to contribute uh, to his promotion video, which I did. And uh, he used my little snippet there. And I was just shocked. But then all of a sudden, this little seed was planted. It's like, I should teach there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought to myself of the times when I was a grad assistant at Kent State, I did have the opportunity to teach the technical students uh, acting technique. However, I had no clue as to how, them, how to bring them in on the why. And being such an enthusiastic how person, I am like, like somebody says, like, you know, try this. I'd be like, well, how do you do it? You know, I, I'd always wanted to do everything. You know, that's just my way but I'm not a technician. I, my way is not everybody else's way. And I had no clue on how to bring in the why into that studio. And it was just a mess, sincere mess. It was, I, I couldn't, it, they didn't enjoy the class. I didn't enjoy being with them in the class. And, and I, it had me scratching my head. The next section I got to teach, I got to teach two section was mostly um, young, like new actors. They were freshmen and they were much more enthusiastic. Um, during the summer, when on the last talk that you did, so thorough, thank you so much for the training. This summer changed my life sincerely. Um, but on the last day of the talks, uh, when we sat at your table, Lisa, and you took us through those things, the why, how, and what of, of um, the artistic mind and, and how, how do we bring people on board, I, it was very shocking to me. I don't know if you remember, but I choked and I went to the, to the, I choked on my water. It was because of this very, very, very subject. So I've been trying to get my head around this, how to not only bring the why, find a why to bring to the students, because I know it's important. Instinctively, I know it's important, but I couldn't find the word. I've been trying to search and now, oh my God, here's Pablo shaking his head yes, and he's doing this. What a blessing, thank you so much, and I will stop talking. <laughs> let's start listening. That's great. So uh, I do want to um, bring Pablo in and just invite you, um, Pablo. If you have a point to launch in, or if yes, yes, right. I do. I'm going directly to the why, and the why is an urgent, urgent matter for this school. The why is the difference between them succeeding or failing in a storytelling. The why is uh, really important for the art that they want to this new breed of designers that they are talking about. Well, those breed of designers, this is urgent because depending on those breed of designers, they can be acting against a, a storytelling. It's not only that that um, that is important or something like that. This is this is just needed. It's a must need to happen if they if they really want to do a new breed of designers. If they want to bring more ledgers of the American theater, the famous 100 ledgers that we have, but that lack unity and really. Uh, are against a, a, a storytelling. Because if they want to say that the students are artists, or if they tell their students that are artists and they convince them that they are artists and they are not, this is gonna be a mess because they are gonna, uh, we are uh, coming back to this moment in history where similar to the Baroque, where more elements of, of a spectacle are added and added and added, and the storyteller gets smaller, smaller, smaller. If they want to do visual and auditory art, you know, they can call it uh, more, I don't know what would the, the name be like this in, in, in the Baroque times, they have a, a name for it. Those, the people will go to the theater to see these spectacles. If they want to do just a spectacle for a spectacle, that's fine. And they will be artists if they want to call themselves that. But without 
and I have some notes here. Without the sensibility toward the actor, toward the director, toward the storytelling process, if, if they lack that, and they lack the, the uh, intellectual capacity of finding the why the story is told, uh, and they and they lack the the investment in in art, which I'm sure they will get that hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. But if this is a storytelling school, uh, and they don't get trained or exposed, right? Because this is just going to be exposure. It's not that it's going to be like a class that they are taking in the curriculum. There is not going to be a major class, right, for them because they're going to be technicians. Yes. But they must take a class that emphasize on storytelling. And and I think um, Michael Chekhov is great because he brings the 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 moment, the study of the moment, and and it, it, it brings the the idea of of the. Um, let me see the the how the and the see I'm I'm see that's why they need to take the class. I need to take the class too, so we can share a vocabulary here. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the 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 inspire moment, right? Yes, the yes, yes, yes. I understand. Inspire moment. So yeah. let's let's talk about the inspire moment and. In the video, they say that they are entrepreneurs, and uh, the person who knows how to run the technology is going to run the design aspects because the this the this if they don't hire a designer and there is a small gig, you know, like a roadhouse that brings people, you know, yeah, the technician ends up designing the 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 looks of the venue, mostly in music. If they don't have that connection with the storytelling, they are just um, being technicians designing, you know, and that's a bad deal. Mm -hmm. That's a bad deal because uh, they are going to, they might um, interfere with the story. They might have too many layers. They might create confusion. They might not know where the climaxes are. They might not know where the motivations are. They might not know all the, um, help me with vocabulary, Lisa. You know, it, all of those things that yeah, you need to know. All the events, yeah, all the, the events. events. The yeah. events, the 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 arch of the story. Yes. Very if they don't understand that, not only they are going to create monsters, because what's going to happen is that we are going to, to uh, have this abusive, abusive visual and, and auditory world that is is like not in link with the with what really needs to be told, right? There has to be a balance. I wrote Lisa because I am I am getting really frustrated when when in the production team they add more and more. Um, technical people that are not investing in the storytelling, they are just thinking of how to solve the technical problems. And they are, they are added to the, to, the, to the production team to create the show. But, but since they uh, lack the, that sensibility, they, they are almost harming actors in the, and, and directors, you know? Yes. So I was telling Lisa, we just need to create a new uh, to have a stage manager for actors and director uh, and the director and to have a, a design manager, a person that is going to oversee all the work of these new artist technicians, because I'm sure they are technicians, but they have to prove they are artists, you know, they have to prove themselves as artists. We, you cannot tell them that they're artists until they are not, because if not, they're going to say, oh, yeah, you know, at color, at movement, at effects, you know, look how, what can I do, you know, how fancy it is, you know, imagine in the Baroque, you know, 
fly, hide, move, that. But we are moving from that. I, I, I believe we are we are getting outside that that visual era finally for saturation. Absolutely. We're starting we're starting the perform performative era in which the 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 the, the, the balance the balance of the old school mm -hmm. story elements need to be protected need to be protected just by knowing them right because mm -hmm. they are if they this is this is what what are they studying that school they're studying tools that's that's the only thing they're studying tools yeah. for what for storytelling or because even now music concerts and everything they they emphasize the storytelling they they want to tell a story through the concert mm -hmm. so in, in corporate corporate corporative events they want to tell a story so everybody wants to tell a story now like everybody wants to to be part of the story there's no and that's great i, I think that's great but we have to be a, a find the the moment the historical moment that we are and don't make the mistakes of of the baroque that sweep the renaissance and all that uh, as, as a, uh, excitement about theater you know in england and spain like it was just like everybody you know and and, and make it more for let's let's throw more money on it so we have more more spectacle so so what the story starts to disappear in the spectacle just just you cannot see it through so many layers so um if they are telling tools they need to they need to know how to they're gonna know how to use the tool but how to use the tool for storytelling how to use the tool the why how what right yes the why are you throwing it there you know like why that intensity why that length why that if you are not saving for the climax or or you are you are not anticipating the climax or, or you know like you are making too many climaxes or mm -hmm. or or you know basic basic things you know and they talk about the the interconnection that they're going to teach those guys right they're going to be super interconnected interconnected among the tools but what about the real thing that they came to do right if i teach somebody how to uh, be a carpenter da, 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 and, and they know all the tools and they know how to do everything but if we don't agree on what do we need to build you know what's what's the point no so i think this is dangerous what they're doing if they don't take a step back and think about that they might uh, end up saturating their own market so fast look at the the images in the video themselves they are they are overwhelming and confusing you know Together, i was actually surprised i was in the video um that yeah. i made the video because i i oh, didn't really see don't... my through line as to like why would they would bring a Cirque du Soleil performer to talk about this school um i was honored to have been chosen to be in the video but i think this the Cirque du Soleil might be a good example because they have a balance between the story and now how the technology can help to tell the story, right? Well, I would like to say that, that in the little uh, segment there that, that you spoke, it seemed as if you were almost describing the history of Cirque du Soleil um, because when it began, it was very much so like this, the balance. Uh, there was a director that had a vision, Franco Dragon, who had a vision of telling the story and every everyone was submitted to that task. Yeah. Uh, after time and after many, many, many billions of dollars made, um, a lot of those entrepreneurs went on just to create their own little segments um, of uh, creativity. And what was coming in were more uh, technicians that were more of people who just to sort of keep keep it going or add more, add more. And when um, Cirque du Soleil tried to, to uh, innovate and bring two Broadway shows to New York City, they both uh, were dismal failures because what was happening there was essentially just a lot of like 
tricks and this and glitz and blood. like you say, spectacular. It was all spectacular, spectacular. And the storyline was very difficult. There, there was a storyline, but it was hard to see. It was very yeah. difficult to track because it was like you, you were blinded to it. Um, and so, they, yes, they lost their way. I mean, of course, they're, they're under bankruptcy now and wh who knows where they might go. Maybe they'll start, the, someone will buy it. You know, who knows what the future holds for, for that company. But um, they had certainly, you know, in the, in the time that I was, I sank, I was with them for nearly 17 years. And um, in the time that I was with the company, you know, it, it started to become more and more of a, uh, how many of these amazing effects can, people, people will like the effects, like how many effects can we throw on this? Because the storylines seem to take a back seat and then take a further back seat and then take a further back seat until almost it was very difficult to even see that there was a storyline to begin with. Um, and, you know, the, the brand was very popular. The, the brand name of Cirque du Soleil would sell those tickets and people started, you know, be, continued coming. It reminded me of the history because I was teaching theater history at Kent State and the theater history of the, of the Ziegfeld Follies who every, it was like the ticket to have back in the day um, before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. um, no one would ever have thought that the Ziegfeld Follies would lose their way and the only, uh, or would lose their popularity. I mean, it, it was the ticket to have in New York City. Um, but sooner or later, people just became tired of, uh, you know, these beautiful pictures with no storyline. And they started going to see, like you said, you just said, like this Renaissance, they, they wanted to go, they'd prefer to be in a, in a space where there was essentially lights on, lights off, and very simple sets and have a very poignant story that reflected their lives, that inspired them, that uh, perhaps like gave them courage you know, and all the things that storylines can do in the theater. Um, they're very intimate, intimate soul changing experiences one can have in those, in those kind of settings. Mm -hmm. As Cirque du Soleil was in its early, in its early inception. Yes, like, um, like uh, Bob Wilson, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's what they love him in Europe because he has unity and he has a spectacle. Yes. It's a lot of spectacle, but it's so linked to the, to, to the story. And it's his all, you know, his soul in his head and he's just an artist, no? Mm -hmm. But uh, Joseph Bob Svoboda, the, the, the light designer, Joseph Svoboda, he, he creates new, new lights as a technician, you know, as a, to, to, to help to tell his stories, you know? Yeah. Uh, this, this of um, keeping adding layers and, and effects and, and uh, that, I mean, you are in a great position to convince them because you've been in, in, in uh, Cirque du Soleil and you have lived through that, you know, from a balance to an unbalance. Yes. So you can tell it, I come here to protect the balance. Yeah. You know? Yes. So, so I they know. Yes. Yeah. So, so at least... At least if they are told to do that, they know as artists that what they are doing, because they will think, and I'm sure a lot of the designers in Cirque du Soleil, that, oh, we are artists and da, da, da. Artists of, a, of a another type of, of spectacle, but no of storytelling, right? Yes. And if you miss the storytelling in the mix, you miss the most important piece, right? Because Absolutely. the actors is the most important piece at the end of the day. We are just to help to tell the story. If we, if we help too much, we, 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 do, we don't do them a favor, all the opposite. Yeah, you get in front, you put a curtain in front of the story. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, so you just have to tell them like, dude, don't, don't hire me if you don't want to, but you have to open this position because there's some, there has to be somebody uh, uh, protecting the, the process. And, and Michael Chekhov, what Michael Chekhov has, I think is like this, this theatrical re rational, you know? It, it's like a, a reason, but applied to theater, like yeah. reason, like it makes sense, you know? Oh, well, absolutely. The, the, the path to inspired action is uh, extremely, yeah, very much so makes sense, yeah. And, yeah, and, I mean, once you go through the training, you it, 
you know, the light turns on and you see it. You have to study it to understand the sense of it. I yes. Hope. Yeah. And, and not only study it, but practice it and, and, and see how it works in, in more than one way. Um, yeah. It does because work. because I, I love Lecoq and that's how he started. And so I'm used not, to... I'm not good. I'm a generalist and I don't know anything, but, but I think uh, uh, Lecoq don't go so into the, the whole picture. It stays more with the actor. It stays more with the, with the, with the, I, I know her daughter tried to do a, a school there in Paris of design. Yeah. And it was great with those, mm, but it doesn't have the rational that Michael Chekhov have, you know, the, yeah. the steps, the, you know, the whole picture, the, the, from the action analysis, from the script to the, to the performance and, and to the, the sensibility. Mm. Um. I was thinking lately when uh, Title IX and, 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 and intimacy in the theater and stuff, and I was like, man, if we will follow Michael Chekhov, these things will be way less likely, like, likely to happen. For me, what's missing from the Lecoq training, and I read his uh, two of his books, I, I think the four brothers, and a sense of the whole, and um, a sense of beauty, form, ease. That like these are things that are, um, as as a group, that they're missing. That are consequential, in, enormously consequential, to creating an inspired performance. Um, that, that's why I most of the clowns that I personally know that are good friends of mine. They're they're such solo artists, um, yeah. and you know, they're solo. They, even their lives are solo. They they live yeah. alone. They perform alone. If they do get in a team, it's a team that never changes. And if someone dies, it's like the, it's over. Like the whole thing is over. Um, and they are so good, but they're so alone, right? Yes. Yes. They are better than anybody, but they are alone. Yeah. It's not a happy life in, at the end of the day. It's not. Mm. Yeah. But, but uh, thinking about how to introduce technicians, you know, and, and technicians, yes, they are... They're close to the design and stuff, but but I think Michael Chekhov brings a more pathway, more structure, you know, uh, uh, curriculum. Yeah, you want to call it because it, it just makes sense. You know? If you were to use the Michael Chekhov te technique to in a room full of designers, and Says you're asking them to like you know put on their flexible clothes and to do the PPEs and to do like um, and maybe it's maybe it was my passion or maybe it was something about me that about me in that room with those people that I couldn't seem to get them to be enthusiastic about that they had worn this uh, this uh, leather of I'm a technician this is stupid actor stuff um, how do you um, break down that that barrier. Um, okay, you gotta, you gotta maybe do like a introductory class on to um, put them in their place, right? And and ask them, do you love theater, or, or do you love what what is theater? You know? Yeah. Who is who is the main? What are we doing here as designers? Are we are we telling a story or we're helping to tell a story, right? Yeah. And, and then, then more, more, uh, more understanding that at the end of the day, the, the magic of incarnation, you know, it comes from the actor, that this is a, a secret business that has been sacred until the Renaissance, all before, you know, theater history, right? It's sure. all be linked to the mystery you know yeah do you want to be with the mystery or do you want to be with the spectacle because if you want to be with the spectacle uh, mm, there is no uh, maybe maybe you are not going to enjoy this but if you do the the if you do with them the exercises of of the going to to the web you know how was it the the cloud of the imagination and stuff. Yes, I love that exercise. Did you it's, do that with them? 
Yeah, it's helped me a lot. Oh, no, I never, no, I did not do that. I did that with Lisa this summer. Lisa. Yeah, because that, that one will engage them quickly, that exercise. You know, like, like mm, uh, use them, use it to say, empower them into their imagination, uh, uh, to develop their imagination, like the imagination as a muscle that yes. you have to practice. And is what happened is that when I was young, I don't know, I don't know if you were young or not, but research was hard, you know, going to the library. Oh, that, that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You remember, yeah. right? You have to trace those things or absolutely. Uh, but now research is so easy, you know, that that some of these they they are losing a little bit of, of the imagination in the shapes, in the forms. So uh Maybe, maybe giving them something, you know, to engage them and say, "Hey, we these these techniques are are gonna help you to come back to to what you already have because it's it's right there. Yes, you have to access it. It's like, and, and is the is the perfect way to understand it with the web, right? Yeah, it's like do research in your imagination. Yes, because you have way more than you think. And also the research with your imagination is going to bring out your individual, individual something that's only yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, something new. Yeah, and, 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 and tell them how wonderful is work collaboratively, how, how fulfilling is to, to really um, understand the process of the actors and the directors and, and and that's what the fun is, really. Like, if you, you, you we, we bring this balance, you know? Yeah. Like, this modern insensibility toward the actor, you know? Yes. It's just, it just goes against what we're doing, you know? And so, it's, um, it's so prevailing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so prevailing with the, with the spectacle and stuff, but, but, we are getting saturated. Um, I mean, we've seen everything already with the, with the, you know, we've seen cats in a hut in Russia, you know, we've, we've seen everything now, you know? Yes. It's like, there's no, and this, this is like, you can tell them like, we need to talk now a little bit about the audience, I think, you know, what's the experience of the audience? Yes. How do they leave the theater? Do they leave it like tired? Like when you go to watch one of these superhero movies? Yes. That you are like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> I was really entertained to the bone that I could not. <laughs> you are almost like dizzy and tired, you know? Instead of being focused and, and purposeful, you know? Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what what I think is going to end, end, up, end up becoming. Uh, like superhero movies on a stage, you know? And Absolutely. Yeah. Can I do a, a little bit of a wrap up uh, to bring us back to the kind of the answers of the why, and then we can kind of get into some of the aims and the challenges that we have to deal with in the technical world and everything. Well, these kind of six things are things that I have embodied from my checkoff training and from my experiences over the last you know, 10, 11 years. They are really the specific things that I carry with me uh, into every project that I work on, regardless of what it's for in terms of kind of a production thing. So probably the most important lesson that I ever learned from Chekhov, and there are many, many, many of them, was beef. Beef? If you're in the technical world, you had better damn well learn beef. Because if you cannot handle the pressures involved in the high stakes technical world, especially as it's now being integrated in, in the media that we have today. It's, in, it's, it's very difficult on the person, on the tech, and it's also really difficult on the rest of the production crew and eventually on the audience. 
And we see that all of the time. If we take a look at various and sundry projects that we watch on online, you know, the most prevalent phrase in human language right now is you're on mute. Literally, if you were to count the probably countless millions of times that phrase is posed in the midst of meetings or whatever, uh, it, it surpasses everything else. And that comes from a function of just not being present in the media that you happen to be working in at the time. So for me, part of beef, beauty is something that you just kind of generally see that's a perspective on the world. And you incorporate that, okay, well, I, everything looks like crap at, the very, at this moment, but I see the overall beauty of it. Form kind of comes from the, you know, from the, the, the design philosophy or whatever. What are we trying to accomplish here? What kind of a, what kind of a medium is it? Form kind of is given to the text as a begin, beginning, and then they work within that form to try to make everything work right. But for me, ease and entirety are the two absolute keys. If I don't have ease, and I can tell you that there were, must have been a thousand times this last weekend when I essentially spent 48 hours in a continuous online in-person production, I, I must have said, take it easy, be cool, be calm, relax, calm down because there was constant crises going on and ease was the tool that I had to have all the time. And then the entirety function of beef is I want to see the overall production, everything that's going on as a complete entire production. I want those people and the people who I was working with this, this weekend, have no idea what entirety means. And so they're all very focused on tiny little piece parts of what they're doing. And there was no overall director of the whole production. And therefore, it was a lot of con little conglomerate projects going on that, that you know we had to try to pull together. And so trying to keep the idea of entirety across the entire technical staff is really crucial and cr critical. You've also heard me do speeches before numerous of the, of the workshops, and probably I think I may have missed the, you know, the workshop that you were in, and so I'm not sure that you saw it. However, you will remember that in that speech, the opening speech, I talk about spiritual purpose. I talk about the idea that we began becoming performers 50,000 years ago, and it is in our DNA all the way up until now. We are driven to perform, we're driven to communicate, but more importantly, we are driven to share our spiritual purpose. Whether that's religious or not, that's a whole different discussion. I don't care about that. I don't believe that religious fervor was any part of Michael Chekhov's idea of spirit. His spirit was, how do I get my heart out there and my thoughts and my meanings out there into the audience so that they then can turn around and take that and share that elsewhere? And you know from everything that we do in, in any of the workshops that we do, that idea of passing on the spiritual um, the, the spiritual magnificence of humanity to everybody who we work with and perform for, that's high critically important uh, purpose to do it. And it leads to the whole context, context of an important piece for the technical crew, whether they are designers or technicians or people running and pulling cables. I am a creative artist. 
we have to inculcate, incorporate that into their thinking so that they realize that they are part and parcel of the production. They are as important as anybody out there and anybody in that production that cannot separate, I mean, that, that tries to separate the actor's purpose and the technician's purpose is simply working against the production. You cannot operate that way. Everybody is part of the production. Everybody depends on everybody else. And, you know, we are kind of relearning that in, you know, in the challenges of the human condition that we are all going through right now. The next thing is that an important tool that everything that we teach in Michael Chekhov and everything that he taught was that it gives us a common language that we are able to share with each other. And so if you are in a product, we of course do this very quickly within our workshops because very quickly we get on the same wavelength with the languages. And, and that's why we share so much of the context of what we're talking about is because we are having this discussion now in the context of that language, which began with Chekhov's teachings. We understand what those are. And if we can create that within a production team, then everybody speaks in a, in a common language and everything goes much faster and much smoother. Everybody is communicating understanding what everybody means by something, whether they agree or not, doesn't matter. You know, but they understand at least what somebody is saying. The, it, I, in all of my productions, I have felt and I kind of understand how it has happened that there's this design gulf, the gulf between design and art. And the fact of the matter is, it should be, and it is the fact that every person on that production team, top to bottom, is an artist. And as Mavis had said, each of them contribute their own creative individuality to the production. And that includes, you know, the tech sitting there on, you know, on a board. Oh, yeah. You know, monitoring levels. There's, they're listening through their ears. They're determining what the audience hears because of what they themselves hear. And so there's, there's a, a judgment process that's going on through all of that in the, in the actual designer who sits down and, you know, draws out the stage plot, the person who creates the lighting plots, that is their judgment, that's design, and that is art artistry at the highest level. And it's important that the actors and the people who are involved in just acting understands that they're not the only ones there who are creating art. Their art only works within the context of the art of the entire production. So the, the last thing I'll talk about the why is I think the most important part that Chekhov has created for me as a person who thinks about 90% of the time about the technicalities of things is that it helps me overcome the crises. There are crises in every single production, bar none. If I hear somebody say, oh, we never had a crisis, I'm going to say, well, then you are keeping your eyes closed because there are crises in every single production that ever happens out there. And it's not that you have a crisis, it's how you deal with the crisis. And so I think that's for me a, 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 a huge overriding benefit to how Chekhov sees the world. Last thing I'll say about this, and we can talk about kind of the aims of what we would like to get out of this, is that I am totally okay with spectacle as long as it is part of and integrated into the job of telling the story. The thing that we have, you know, what you talked about, Pablo, is that we have all seen 
everything, well, what we have all seen everywhere, everything are millions and millions of little snippets of TikTok or little little tiny. Uh, this is my my you know my moment of time in the sun or whatever. And there's no real purpose for it other than to show how cool I am or how great I am or you know how I look or how I can dance or whatever. You know, there's, it's not telling a story. It's just showing who I am. And that's the thing I think we want to get away from in the whole technical realm is creating spectacle because that's what the tool happens to be able to do. We need to create the tools that we're going to use after we know what the purpose of the story is so that we can then customize the tools to make the story come across. So those are my ideas for now. And I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you, Charlie, so much. Um, and um, Charlie, um, I, uh, I want to turn it over for back over to, um, to Pablo, because I think Pablo's got a class that he needs to go to. Yes. So uh, we will continue this conversation. And of course, you'll get the, the link to the video, Pablo. Great. Uh, but before you leave, is there anything else you want to share? I mean, it's been fantastic. I feel like I've been experiencing a master class here. So <laughs> I, I really like what, what Charlie said. And, and that's what I was trying to say before, you know, that, that idea, and I didn't say it, but it's true that some of that letter that you, Demian said, that Midas says, that the designers put on, you know, is, is also not to be hurt, you know, because sometimes they are pushed away. And one of the things that Charlie said, you know, you can empower them to, to know that they have the right of their spiritual contribution, right? That they have a right of their spiritual contribution that they that they have to um, fight for the right, you know, instead of protecting themselves and saying, ah, I'm just like, you know, I'm a techie, drink my beers, you know, <laughs> because, because they want that. Everybody wants connection. Yes. And there is no better connection than here. And they are, a lot of times, they get into that defensive, you know, because we, we blame them when, they f when something fails in the technical world, as, as Charlie said, it's just so many things can go wrong and technology and stuff. And, and I like what he says that overco overcoming crisis, like that, that reliance to adversity because at the end of the day, it's in a spiritual, and in that sense, there is no really bad doing, you know? There's no, nothing is wrong, you know? Everything is perfect because it had to be that way, you know? And, and, and so, so maybe one of the things that you can contribute to that school is, is to empower those, those new designers to really be part of, of this, of this, uh, the common language, of course. I don't know if they will be using that language, but they can spread it. They can say, when I say this, I mean this, you know, they can use it yeah. to clarify their thoughts, right? And, and I was thinking just to close the, the, the technicians of the, of the no theater, you no, know, those that they are there this guy that is on a stage, you know, just accommodating the costume and helping the, the actor with the costume. And he's as much part of that performance mm -hmm. as the actor right there, you know, he's fully understands everything that has to happen. And, and that will be like a, an example of, of that. But yeah, the, I, I will reiterate, you know, the, the right of, of the, of, of the spiritual contribution, you know, because the good thing about Michael Chekhov that I see is that it's good for actors. It, it doesn't damage them like other other techniques and stuff, right? Nobody, it might not do, the only thing that it can do is good for you, 
right? But it's not gonna do bad for you. Yeah. But I think some of the process of of the business and the all of that they can really damage um, technicians, mostly and designers as well. You know, and, and bringing that safety net. You know, it's like we're talking now a lot about intimacy training to protect the actor. So what about the what about what was the ethical uh, um, protection safety net for the for the designer to try new things to bring up you know instead of getting that thick skin of you know here come the actors to the theater oh my god you know yeah no you know so so yeah very good Charlie yeah you summarize it all. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Midas, I would love to be in touch with you too. I'll make sure everybody's in touch. Perfect. Yeah. Huge Thank pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Same. Yes. Bye guys. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat> so I would like to talk about um, uh, uh, jump in a little bit and go to the uh, some some specific concepts uh, about the checkoff technique and uh, that were prompted by <clears throat> the a question and exchange that Mavis and I had about the um, psychological gesture, for example, and yes. about some specific techniques. So um, I too had made notes and my, my notes, really uh, you, you guys all shared many, many thoughts that I also also have. And it's that sort of concept for the live event technician that these, these live events have happened from the cave to the Colosseum. They've happened from the church to the cabaret. They're on stages all over and have been throughout all of humanity's existence on this planet. And, and they have always been inspired by the unity of the ensemble that brings them together. And if we always hold, as Mr. Chekhov does, the importance of the audience, the spectator, and the unity of what is brought to the spectator with uh, the aims and the purposes of those who bring the offering to the spectator, to the audience. And that um, the, when, the, uh, when a technician can understand this unique creative artist and this individuality and this spiritual current that drives us to bring this to make this connection with the audience, then uh, we have some really strong fundamental um, uh, tools like Atmosphere, which of course uh, an organization like Cirque du Soleil, a show like the shows like Cirque du Soleil are very, very atmosphere intense. Yes. Uh, intensive and when we understand that the atmosphere is the most unifying aspect it's the soul of the of the story that's being told um, we know that that's what permeates and lingers with the audiences for the length of their life really when you go to a great concert you go to a great ball game you go to a great opera uh, even a great rally of some kind, there are, uh, there's an overall vibe to the event that has drawn the person there. And that shows up in the very first design of the public relations, right? So everything from your graphic artists um, to those who literally print those papers or transform those JPEGs into, you know, memes or whatever mm -hmm. the technology is, are going to really want to understand the fundamental concept of atmosphere. 
and how it permeates every element of the form and can be enriched through the creation of every aspect. And then specifically, uh, we, were, we were wondering about the nature of the PPEs and just understanding these fundamental concepts of how uh, expanding and contracting happens in the music, in the visuals, in the staging, in the construction of the props, the costumes, the set pieces, every aspect in, uh, and how this movement through the tensions of earth, water, air, and fire, the qualities of movement, how when a production takes the audience on that ride through all of those, how impactful it is for the spectator and understanding how gesture, how the story pushes and pulls, how it lifts and smashes, how it gathers and tears and throws and penetrates, how it drags and how it reaches. Um, are it, Those gestures are happening in, in every element of the production, the entire mise-en-scene. And so when a, a technician and a designer, when they understand that these principles are living through the whole process of the storytelling. They can lead their imaginations, like we were saying, Pablo was saying, how we need to build the muscles of the imagination through these questions. You know, where does this show expand? Where does it contract? Where does it mold, float, fly, radiate? Uh, where does it push? Where does it punch? Where does it pierce? And uh, and so what is the, uh, as you move on, where, where do the tensions rise and fall? Where do they balance? Where, they, where do they have uh, moods, qualities, uh, the, the range of the emotional flow mm -hmm. and the dynamic tensions, the tempo rhythm changes, the changes in the lighting, uh, the changes in the, uh, in the music shifts, the light motifs, the subtle um, mechanical sounds, the quality of the bell, mm -hmm. for example, and how the quality of that bell invites an expansion or a contraction. The rhythmic waves and repetitions, the crescendos and diminuendos that manifest in color and in color in the tone hue, vibrancy, luster, luminosity, all these different layers and the timbre and all the, all the different qualities in the audio realm and the tempo and rhythm of a light cue uh, of, of a scene change, uh, the tempo and rhythm of the line and form of the set itself, every aspect uh, of design and the execution, the movement of the set itself mm -hmm. becomes part of the creative act that deepens and enriches the atmosphere and drives the soul of the story forward. And all of this is, of course, contingent upon understanding what we call the synth analysis. Yes. Of, of the story, really understanding the structure, the arc, the nine events, the opening and the closing events that happen in our imagination solely and that set up the dynamics for the story being told. When all the technicians and all the designers and all the actors and directors and staff are on board with what those are, they have the ability to multiply by many more than just the number of, of artists collaborating. The collaboration expands um, in, in a quantum kind of way. And the psychological gesture, finding the psychological gesture for the production to the spectator. What is the gesture between them when the technicians understand the gesture of this story's desire for the audience? And then the gestures 
understanding the gestures of each scene within and each moment that the central psychological gesture of the atmosphere of the of the uh, set piece itself. I, Mr. Chekhov talks about the gestures of trees and the distinct difference, for example, between a weeping willow and a grand giant bur oak. Uh, their gestures are extremely different. And this is the same, the gesture in a couch, the gesture of a staircase, the gesture of a picture frame. They are completely um, unique. Each form is unique. So the gesture inherent in the form and how it impacts the audience on in all the audience's senses, which leads me to a very... Um, interesting thing that that when we talk about the experience of the technical world very often it is focusing on lifting the sensorial experience of the uh, of the audience and so it's often about what we see and what we hear and it's often limited to those two senses. But in Michael Chekhov's work, and as we go more deeply into the work, so more beyond what we can do in just the Chekhov uh, you know, training intensive, uh, are expanding, it is expanding the definition of the senses to include 12 senses, not just what we smell and taste and, and touch and see and hear, but these deeper soul and spiritual senses, the sense of rhythm, that sense of uh, the individuality, the sense of aliveness that we feel, the sense of cold and warmth in all its metaphoric and physical and kinesthetic uh, expressions. These kinds of expanded appreciation of the senses and the expanded sense of color and color as uh, on all its levels of impact. The, uh, what I was talking about, about the hue or the luster or the luminosity, um, uh, the, the density of, you know, the expanding and the contract, contracting the amount of flatness or shine, right? of something and how this not only affects the visual, but how it creates a kinesthetic impact, how it creates a sense of vitality or death, how the luster creates a sense of warmth or the flatness, maybe a sense of cold on the metaphoric and kinesthetic realm. So when we uh, as designers and technicians have a deeper and richer understanding of, of humanity's multiple senses that are not generally spoken about in the everyday world, we then can invite the question of how can I work with warmth or how can I work with a human being's sense of aliveness? And this sense of aliveness, for example, the sense of inner well-being is what Pablo was speaking about, about when you walk out dead and drained from a highly visual, exciting, you know, powerful story, but you walk out feeling drained mm -hmm. versus focused, alive. So understanding that sense of creating a living production where the technology is living, it's that's when it contains this mystery that I loved what Pablo said about, you know, do you want to just deliver that technology? Uh, do you, or do you want to be part of the mystery, creating that mystery and delivering that mystery? And so th these, uh, our goal, Mr. Chekhov's goal, when he talked about a theater of the future, uh, he had all have his actors trained in all the technical areas. They all had to design. 
they all had to work with the design for the lighting, for the costumes, for the props, for the set designs. And his designers all had to participate in the acting training. And this process gave the actors such a rich respect for the creativity of the designers and the technicians. This understanding the sense of timing and rhythm that the Chekhov work really brings forward can make a whole difference on how someone pulls a hemp rope. I mean, when you when you're in an old hemp house and you have to pull a drape, uh, you know, or you have to push on, uh, you know, a set piece, that tempo and rhythm and the quality of that is just like. Pablo was speaking about, it requires the art of that no theater artist that from the from the no theater, uh, that that there's a, they train for years to be able to master this role uh, of, of the technician there. And so uh, we have as our primary goal as storytellers, the task of what I call the big ask, which is to be able to access images, to be able to choose the great images, and then to be able, you know, that selection process, the access and the selection, and then the conveyance to get the image, to choose from all the images we can get, and then radiate create craft, get that image to the audience. And anything that can help those technicians and designers understand how the soul forces are built up of the thinking realm, the feeling realm and the will force, how the, that process of thinking, feeling and willing the psychology of the stage, the psychology that is represented in colors that are thinking colors, in sounds that are thinking sounds, in lines, in the spiritual, if you understand spiritual geometry, how it affects the form and how, and this, uh, in Michael Chekhov's work, he brought in eurythmy, which brings in spiritual geometry to be able to help the artists understand in their body. And that brings me to another thought about understanding the different learning ways, learning pathways for, uh, for humans uh, beyond our format system we were speaking of about why and what and then how and what if, we also have those people who learn kinesthetically and create kinesthetically. Mm -hmm. And there, there are designers and technicians who have a feel. Like a friend of mine was the um, technical director uh, on a show on Broadway before all this programming came. And he ran the board, all the sound lights, he, he ran it all without a book. He did not follow a script. He ran it through his kinesthetic forces. He knew the rhythm in his body. And that's a very different kind of technician than someone who follows word by word cues. And when a person follows a word by word cue, they get really into trouble when the word is not delivered, which means that you know if, if a, an actor has a little shift in how they're speaking or delivering on in a particular performance then that technician is left without being connected to the flow they can't improvise so they have no jazz we need to train jazz musician techies yeah and also that rhythm and feel when Perhaps that board was programmed in, in Miami, Florida, and now the show is in Berlin. That that feel and rhythm is is not going to be the right feel and rhythm um, for that time and moment and that culture. And yes, um, yes, to be in the moment is is, is everything. And it's also an an important driver on making certain that 
everybody is very connected to the story. Because if you know the story, then if the line doesn't come off correctly, you can do that. You can get that kind of kinesthetic feeling of, okay, well, you know, this is probably about the moment that I need to do this based on what's going on in the story versus, oh, I'm, I'm watching for the words. No, nope, word, I'm not changing until I hear that word. So, I, you know, it's really, I'm, a, I'm kind of a hybrid tech in that I am very much attuned to enjoying knowing what's going on in the script, but, but there's also this overwhelming need to just feel the story of unfolding and, and letting the tech work be driven by that. Yeah. And it, it's really exciting when uh, our technicians can uh, understand what the essential archetypes are that are living in in the world. So this concept of archetypes, as, as we experience them as archetypal gestures, archetypal movements, um, but archetypal energies in general, these forces of good and evil, understanding these forces of good and evil, uh, understanding the laws of composition, the triplicity, the polarity, um, and the art of transformation, knowing to ask these questions, understanding that the that all performances must be full bodied performances, the beep that we work with, the production itself is, a, is its own spiritual being that has to be full bodied. And every element of tech is part of the body, as part of the body of the show. And understanding that every part of the body has to have a unified field of focus toward that um, toward that aim and then and that's where things like the focal points come in and understanding uh, just jumping back to for example molding flowing flying radiating the element of water and we understand that water is always h2o right but water as h2o that's the technical thing about it but water where is water? Water lives in the air. It expresses itself in the air. It expresses itself in the earth, right? It expresses itself in light. And so we, when we understand that there is water, for example, the archetype of water, this archetypal element of water has as many ex creative expressions uh, as, as you know, it, it manifests in everything. So to understand these very basic fundamental elements um, so that when a theme arises that, you know, for example, if there's a, I remember one of our, uh, one of our uh, certified teachers did a production of the seagull and she got an image for, she got an image that had, that was kind of a, a swirl. Uh, and it was a flight pattern of the seagull, of a seagull. It was a flight pattern basically of a seagull. And that wound up appearing on a very subtle level in the uh, roof line of the little theater they set on the, you know, on the shore, it wound up appearing subtly in, in, in the desk office setup. It wound up appearing in costuming. This, this image, uh, and it, and it appeared in the graphic design. So this image became a metaphor that was reflected in all the technology. And, uh, and, and it was in effect, the psychological gesture of the production. Yes, yes, okay. So these are, uh, when we train ourselves as an ensemble to be a 360 degree artist, uh, we will enable that, you know, what Pablo said, we will, we will activate the ownership of the technologist's um, spiritual contribution. 
And what he was talking about, uh, about this Title IX and this uh, intimacy and things like that, these uh, rights and fairnesses and protections, um, this suggestion that when you work with the beef, with the beauty, the ease, the entirety and the form that Charlie was talking about, mm -hmm. uh, when you work with that real sense of contact ensemble and that I am a creative artist and I see you, that sense of the other and honoring and being in contact with the other, the way Chekhov really invites us to respect and honor the other, your your ability to work in intimate situations comes so naturally and easily. And the need to train people to respect each other is built into Michael Chekhov's lectures on love, on the power of that radiance and contact and that openness. It starts right from that ball toss. It starts from everything is perfect. Let's, you know, when it drops, there's the crisis. Let's accept it. Let's collaborate. Let's open our hearts to the, you know, the reality of what is and allow new information to arise. So uh, these are all um, elements that I wanted to reinforce uh, and, and open up. In, in regard to my thoughts about the why yeah. Michael Chekhov's technique can be incredibly valuable, uh, especially for such a school as the one that is opening. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I got from that was an aha, as often happens when I listen to Lisa talk, Re relates to the fact that we are now all being challenged with the idea of how to create artistry that involves body, voice, and spiritual energies in the realm of PPE and all of the various requirements that a facility or a, or a location or, or an event requires or whatever. And it occurred to me that we can position those as a manifestation of veils in the, in the terms of or in the forms of veiling a performance, veiling something that we're doing. We do that through all of our exercises. We learn and play with and try different veiling levels on, on most everything that we do. If we look at the idea of a PP, of a mask, wearing a mask, that's an incredibly uh, out front visible veil that you have to deal with, not unlike having to be inside of some kind of a massive costume and yet you still have to get your energy out into the audience. Otherwise, you're just a mechanical place on the, on the stage or whatever. And so the challenge for the tech and is to try to make that process as simple and easy as possible for the actors. But as well, it's also important that the actors realize that they're being, you know, their their veiling is being enforced for them. And this is the time where they have to recognize that the only way that I get out there entirely is if I make certain that I am at my maximum expanded energy level as I'm putting it out there. And so one of the things that a director of tech and a director of acting can do is to make that process part of the rehearsal and make it part of the process is that you you have to be able to make certain that your energy level is being put out there 
with every possible thing that you can. It's very similar to how do you feel, how is it that you somehow or another intimately feel the energy from, you know, somebody like Anthony Quinn through a small close-up screen of his eyeballs. Is We all have experienced that function, that it is so powerful that we are emotionally overcome by it. And that has to be put into place throughout. You know, we, we might say, well, he just has some kind of a magical power. But what we know in our training is where he got that power, which was, I know how to, you know, make certain that regardless of how much of my personal presence is being transmitted, I am putting out maximum energy through, through whatever that veil is. And I think that's an area where that's a specific technical challenge that we have to deal with now and an area where we can really help the world figure out how to do that. If you were training technicians in this, uh, in essentially in this chart of, would you train them in the same way that we did by giving them a short scene to memorize, characters to play, like training them, like say if you were, when you were training your designers, were you, would you be training them in the same way um, for them to try out the tools whether they be focal points, atmosphere, on the lines that they had learned. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I you know I remember when um, when Pablo came, he he was uh, self conscious because of uh, being a designer and not being an actor. And do I really have to do you know this right. question? Do I have to do the scene? And yes, absolutely. Uh, I, the sense of play that he was able to find, uh, just as an example of uh, you, I really loved what Pablo said about, uh, about meeting them where they are in the beginning. Yes. And having that, uh, you know, really opening up that conversation about, do they want to be part of the mystery? You know, is that yeah. really what they're there for? Do you just, you want to be your own little star who's the spiffiest light designer, you know, around who, you know, doesn't know anything about how to really become part of the mystery? Who do you want to be? And, and when, because if you want to be part of the mystery, you want to know this work. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason to learn why you're here is to be part of the mystery. Yeah. Right? To take your skills, your gifts, your talents, and your technical abilities and raise them to a higher level that is beyond the conscious perception, right? And moves into mystery. And when you have when you get that buy-in, um, then then coming in with the same sort of it's perfect, uh, just understanding the vulnerability that they will inevitably feel, right? Yes. And as at, at, and then working and you may, um, you might begin with a monologue first rather than throwing them right into a scene. So just so mm -hmm. they get some, get accustomed to getting their, their vocal work and their movement work united. Yeah. Uh, and they don't yet have to be interdependent with another human being. They can focus on creating their relationship with their imagination and expression. There. Yeah, absolutely. That now, might... Mavis, when we do foundation course on a weekend or something, we actually use Spooner monologues as a general rule because they're so simple and easy to learn and easy to learn how to express. But there's a lot of challenge in, you know, creating that individuality, for, you know, for that. That you know, it's it's not so much about the, you know, the learning the lines as it is about understanding the nature of storytelling, and you know, the idea that you are part of that story, even if you're pulling cables behind the scenes, that you are part of that story. 
And you'll notice that in our synth analysis nights that it is strongly urged that the entire production crew, top to bottom, in all encompassing everybody is actually part of that first section, which is, you know, developing the themes and developing the, the ideas and developing the overall PG of the production. Yeah. You know, it may be that a tech may then go on to do some other things and not worry so much about, okay, at, you know, at um, act two, you know, scene three, you know, third line, we're going to shift, you know, to a, you know, a, 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 a general atmosphere of, you know, funeral home, you know, in the garden right. kind of thing. But as long as they are connected to and constantly reminded of the overall general PG for the whole production, then they can then begin to feel like they are part of the whole process. And, and learning those lines, even if there's just a few of them, kind of gets them into the idea of, of storytelling, what that involves. Mm -hmm. I think being part of that, I think, significantly improved my understanding of the technical production process over the years. And I think I strongly urge that every technical person in a class become get the opportunity essentially to tell their own story. I, you know, what came up for me when you said that, Charlie, was I was thinking that just like the words came to my mind is like that, that to say to, to a, tech, a young technician, you're, you're, you're not an actor, but you have to be a storyteller. You have to be a storyteller. Yes. And that's where that line that's where that line has to be drawn. Yeah, that's yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh my God. And um, one of the things that we do with that, uh, with those Spoon River monologues, uh, is we create that um, ensemble presentation piece that includes the Japanese rock garden. Yes, that's right. Forms and uh, where everyone uh, like the beauty, ease, entirety, and form exercises we do with the chairs, right? We, we build into, we build from those chair exercises into moving random objects and set pieces and, and redesigning the set and redesigning our physical forms moving from a spontaneously created Japanese rock garden, which is held and then someone breaks out and does their monologue and then it, uh, it's sustained for a moment and everybody moves to a new form mm -hmm. and they can move the, the set pieces themselves or they can move their bodies on the set trying to you know, engage with the rock garden principles, engage with the psychology of the stage principles and um, focal point principles. And, uh, and you wind up, if you have 10 classmates, they each, they go through one at a time, their monologues, changing the form of the ensemble rock garden in between each monologue. And then they all go again and do the monologue in a very opposite kind of way. And we have them enter the stage as an ensemble singing a Amazing Grace in an atmosphere of a funeral dirge. And then by the time the last person has completed their second version, which is in a, which, you know, we invite them to use a victorious kind of version for the second one. Mm -hmm. um, everyone at the end bursts into a jazzed up version of celebrating their, you know, their transformation, you know, uh, of Amazing Grace. Yeah. So it's got a story uh, as a whole. It's got the feeling of the whole. And it's got this transformation and, uh, and, 
everyone's working on the forms. And so it, I think it, that would be a particularly effective way of engaging their design minds on a, you know, in a kinesthetic level uh, and helping them build that sense of ensemble feeling of the whole having to listen. And if they need to, and they have struggling with memorization, they can always hold their lines, you know? So it's always perfect. And if they forget their lines, they just, you know, they start, they break out of their form, they start delivering their monologue and they get two sentences in and they are blank and they just sustain their blank and they start moving, everybody moves and and they pretend that was all they meant to do. <laughs> like the crisis that we're gonna work with, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really is a dynamic devised, piece of devised theater. And it happens spontaneously in the moment of actually performing. You have a general form that you're going to create the, the performance from, but as the performance begins, it is completely spontaneous and so you're devising theater in the moment without directorial control. Everybody's doing it somewhat similar to how we do, you know, the, the radiation exercise at the beginning of the performance. It just, fe you feel your way through the whole thing. And it's a, that's a great thing. And that really leads to the whole idea that's been prevalent in a lot of more local productions and and now even a lot of production you know professional productions where the crew i mean where the cast is the crew or the cast is major part of the crew and yeah. you just find in extremely integrated in the moment ways of repositioning you know pieces of the set without having to take a whole big break you know to to do that it it's very fun and it and it's fun to do and it's very interesting to watch. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the some of the videos of these uh, presentations, but uh, there are some on on YouTube, so I can send you the link for that. We can post it in the uh, in the chat uh, below the uh, the YouTube video. There. Yeah. Other thoughts, Mavis, Charlie. I when you're dealing with technical people, the, the questions are going to come up about the technical challenges that we are having to overcome in order to create this production. So obviously you always have you know, audio visual technical issues. How are you going to do it? What are you going to do it with? You know, how much money do you have to spend on it, et cetera? Uh, you also have, you know, the, the, you know, technical skills of people and um, the various pieces of, you know, are you going to use cameras or are you going to use projections or are you going to use, you know, incorporate those somehow or another within set pieces or almost create a, an online movie or TV show through the process, a live TV show. In addition, in today's world, you also now have the whole issues about bandwidth and connectivity arrangements, and you have how you're going to frame the video, not just for the local audience, but for a viewing audience that's out there watching on a computer screen. You've got to deal with the issues of streaming platforms, et cetera. And amongst all of those, I would say that the big question is, you know, you've got to make certain that there are technical skills involved in each of those areas. You know, there's no one person. I, I was this weekend, this last weekend, I was probably one of one of three who could actually do, you know, most of or much of the technical stuff that we were having to do. But I was in I ended up being the only one who could actually make it all kind of come and work together. Well, that's too. No, that's not enough. You know, you need to have some technical skills involved because nowadays the technical issues are extreme. And if you're doing something that is like a TV show, what you know is the moment that you know you know, the moment that the lights go on, 
all of your preparation is over and now you're in a dynamic situation of having to do it live and everything that occurs as a crisis in the midst of that and the time the lights go out is all got to be dynamically done on an instantaneous basis. That takes some skills that, you know, that any group of people who are trying to create that production can do. You can't just say, oh yeah, well, old Bob, he's got his own computer, you know, and he's been working on it, you know, for a couple of years. Let's make him the technical director, you know, that you can't do that in this environment. You know, as many of us, you know, operate on Zoom, you know, on a, almost a daily basis now, there are precious few and very, very, very few people who really understand the Zoom platform at a deep enough level that they can interconnect these things with live audiences and streaming platforms and all of this and do, and, tr and instead of using web cameras, you're now actually using professional cameras that are tied into the web. Those are technical issues that have to be kind of dealt with. And, and it's probably a good time in a class like you're having, like you're suggesting, to deal with some of that at some level. Yeah. But, you know, it's dynamic. And so it's, it's based on, you know, where the production is and what their resources are and what the skills and capabilities are. But it's something that people really need to know. Because what the production really needs is a person or, or two who can kind of see all of the elements coming together and make certain that through that whole conglomerate of huge challenges that have to be done, that somebody is maintaining the story, making certain that the ensemble is still safe. And, and so that's an area of really real focus and training that I would suggest. I got another idea too um, from Charlie. You you sparked this um, is for your POAs uh, for your um, you know practice, observe, apply your home play um, to have your technicians uh, look for in their technical other tasks, their other classes, their other assignments for classes and things like that. To have them, for example, if you were teaching them expansion contraction, you would say, uh, you look at all the different ways that expanding contracting expresses itself and then ask them, uh, you know, when I, when I teach, I, I say, you know, where does this happen in the world, right? And I ask the students to tell me where. So here you can say, where does this happen in, for example, a, a concert? If you're running lights for a concert, where does expanding contracting happen? If you're creating a design for, uh, you know, a, a live fashion show, where does expanding contracting come into play? Right. So, you know, if you're doing sound, you know, if you're operating the microphones, what is the equivalent of expanding and contracting on, a, you know, in the audio system? So invite them to do their, uh, you know, practice, observe, apply in, uh, you know, in whatever areas they are also learning their. Yeah. I love that. And there's a lot of POA opportunities on YouTube, and you can find some spectacularly well done productions there. People who have really done amazing, you know, technical presentation through the challenges and created incredibly, you know, deep, deeply impacting stories. You can see you know, a thousand times more productions, whether they're one minute productions or hour and a half long productions, you can see many, many, many more where you can tell in the first two or three minutes that nobody ever gave any consideration whatsoever to how this thing would actually come across to a person sitting at a computer instead of sitting in the theater. And 
And those are POA opportunities that you can say, that really worked, and that one definitely did not work. And, and, you can, and it's pretty simple, you know, for you to begin quickly to say, well, this is why it didn't work, or that's why that worked. You can, you can identify specific, you know, characteristics that are pretty easy to say, oh, yeah, well, that was, uh, you know, right there that the actor was, you know, trying to contract or whatever, but the, the camera just expanded 100%, you know, and you can kind of tell the discontinuities, what, you know, the disclicks throughout a production that would cause it not to work. One of the most important ones is atmosphere. If there's no atmosphere in the production, people will never, ever, ever get the story completely. It won't mean anything. Yep. But you can see productions, stuff that comes out of NT Live is just blow away stuff. I am constantly amazed at how they can create a, a production that actually takes a, a full-blown, physical, in-person stage production and make it into a fabulous piece of video art, you know, on whether it's in a movie screen or a television screen. What it's just, you, you know, I think there are people who have it and people who don't know how yet. What did you say, Charlie? MT Live? MT Live, yeah. National Theater Live. Look at some of their productions and you can just say, God, they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> they really understand. Whether or not they have the same specific language that we have doesn't matter. You can tell, you know, you can see a lot of the Chekhov archival discoveries embedded in other people's, you know, pre creative individualities. They may not use the same words, but they get the same idea. Um, you know, there's... Uh, there's a an aspect of um, live event that uh, where where live event is broadcast, um, which may or may not be part of this particular training, um, but it goes it aligns very much with what Charlie was talking about the National Theater Live's ability to uh, to capture on camera what they've created in during a live performance and um, being a, creating a uh, catalog of wins and losses uh, of examples where it worked and where it didn't work, it could be tremendously useful. And mm -hmm. uh, it really could be useful. Uh, I, would, I, I would love for that to become, you know, part of our design certification uh, track in terms of uh, having material to to help teach designers these concepts and and show examples of what works, what doesn't. And I had a very specific example, and it's actually on YouTube. Um, my production of um, of Effie's Burning, F E E F F I E, Effie's Burning, and it, it's on YouTube. And uh, it was great. We are theater was actually a in a theater in Los Angeles where they taught on camera classes. So they had a built-in two camera setup and the owner of the theater was kind enough to shoot it for us. And, he, and we got into that theater because the other actor was two persons, myself and the other actor was a friend of his. And she had a very, very climactic moment. She has the big climax of the whole play and uh, and he went, moved into a close-up for her big climax. And as a result, you cannot even see the climax because the climax was a climax of the entire mise-en-scene as it was directed. Um, ultimately, she's been most of the time lying in a hospital bed and for the climax, uh, in, and she's in violet, kind of cold violet light. And for the climax, she's describing when she basically, you know, had a little sort of psychotic fracture and burst into flames and lit a house actually on fire from this spontaneous combustion rage that flowed through her. 
And as she tells the story, she literally stands up on top of the bed and does an expansion. She goes from this contraction in the bed, climbing up and expands and opens her whole body out. And, and the lights turn to flaming red. And so on this stage, it's a very polar transition, a really powerful expansion and, and that you want to see, you want to, you want to pull back and you want to see the wide shot. Um, and he and he stayed and went into a close up, so you you don't even see is is she stands up. It, it's like like staying in a close up yes, here, yes, yes. right? Instead of seeing this incredible expansion that goes full body, you mm -hmm. barely even see that the lights have turned mm -hmm. from no, it affects the entire space. Yeah, yeah, from mm -hmm. lavender to red, you can barely see it. Wow. So you see her performance, but her perf you see this part of her performance, but the power of her performance was in her legs and in the outreaches mm -hmm. of her hands. Uh, what impacted us as an audience was the spectacle of from this, this contracted state moving into her full rage and transformation of power from this cold. Was, this is an example of using cold and warmth, right? Yeah. In, the, in the energy and the technology remained cold, right? The technician chose to stay in yeah. this shot. Yes, the transition didn't happen for the broadcast. Right, thinking that he was doing a favor for her. You know, so, but not understanding you know, the, the elements of focal point, not understanding the elements of heat and cold, not understanding the element of expanding, contracting, not understanding the, the you know, climactic moment fully. And that's, a, and that's probably attributable to the fact that the camera person was brought in at the last minute and was not actually part of the entire production from the first, from the first day. Didn't well, know the story. Yeah. yeah, and 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 fundamentally, didn't didn't follow the story. Did yes. Not, yeah. 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 Didn't no. exactly. Yeah. I would. Just, I just give you an example for you to go look up, Mavis. Last year's production of Jesus Christ Superstar Live yes. with John Legend. Yep. I think was maybe one of the most spectacularly filmed or or taped and it's taped now obviously but i watched it live it most spectacularly produced live event that i've that i've ever seen it was i mean it was it was amazing and the and it was basically built from the very beginning in in its earliest design stages it was built to be a live audience to a live national global viewership. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that required that every single element of the technical aspect had to be there working from the very first moment. Yeah. And um, and I just thought it was spectacular. If you can if you can find that somewhere and watch it, turn your sound up really nice. And I, it'll, I mean, I think, watch it on a big screen, it'll, I think it'll blow you away. I did watch it live with the rest of the world, but um, where were the rest of the country or wherever it was. I was one of the live viewers. Of, on yeah. The, on yeah. Just so luscious, you know, it's luscious. Uh, it was a luscious tapestry of that whole production. And I, what I think amazed me was the fact that they that somehow, how they integrated that set into the audience. And, yeah. and you know, they were, you were, as the outside viewer, as the TV viewer, you weren't just watching from some distance like you were looking through a keyhole. It's like you were there moving around the stage watching all of this stuff unfold. Yeah. It was just beautifully done. And they, that had one of the most stunning moments I've ever seen on TV which then uh, they did pull to that wide shot when oh. crucifix ascended mm -hmm. when jesus ascended 
and and retracted and you saw this massive set piece and you saw him disappear and they left the screen white in silence mm -hmm. and they let it radiate in plain white in silence i want to watch it again now <laughs> a, a long time and that was like wow there is a white blank scene radiating across the screen on national television for i don't know it felt it, it it was like 30 seconds or something it was a long time in silence and and it was stunning because it really allowed the whole production to permeate us and yeah. for yeah. us to just sit there in awe yeah. it. So it, I mean, that was one where the, the atmosphere comes through the screen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it proves to people who say, oh, you can't get energy, you know, from from here to there through all of this electronic stuff. If you're sitting in, in a screen watching that, you are getting every single instant of atmosphere that's coming out of that show. It's chilling. So uh, I think it'd be a great way to teach to be able to show some technical events and and invite, give them an assignment to find, you know, have them do the work for you. Have them, you know, you come in with one or two examples and say, okay, you go find an example of, uh, of you know, an expansion contraction that works with the tech and the event and an expansion contraction that does not work yeah you know so this this kind of i think these kinds of things will really get them to um you know to buy into the information to apply the tools to their craft yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when they see evidence of it yep thank you so much for for this discussion today for your time for your energy for your thoughts well, thanks for creating the the platform for us to because we don't we just we live this stuff every minute of every day and deal with it without thinking about the the bigger context of it or whatever and so your question has caused us to kind of think outside of the box and at what we tend to do and teach and practice ourselves i'm so blessed i have you to come to to ask the question it means so much um, yeah it's ensemble yeah I, it is so amazing that pablo was able to join us that was yes, yes yes incredible what a fabric of artists and human beings um involved in nmca bodies. Ah! 